have one Verners in hand. We have microphones that are hot, and it's time for your Daily Detroit. It's Thursday, June 13th. I'm Jer Stays. And I'm Sven Gustafson with an update edition of Daily Detroit. The Motor City is humming with stories. We'll run them down for you right after this. Daily Detroit is brought to you in part by Repurpose. That's where you can get hired by Detroit's best startups and companies. Repurpose connects top talent like you with purpose-driven companies based on values, experience, and culture fit. Join their talent community at repurpose.co. That's repurpose.co. There may be yet another twist in the ongoing saga over the new bridge to Canada. Republican state lawmakers have attached a rider to a budget proposal that could prevent the use of state funds to construct Michigan's portion of the new Gordie Howe International Bridge. As a refresher, the new span is set up to go up. Bleh. As a refresher, the new span set to go up in Detroit's old Delray neighborhood is to be paid for entirely by Canada. Under an agreement, they're covering the entire $4.4 billion cost of the bridge. However, there has been ongoing resistance from some Republicans, who notably received large donations from competing Ambassador Bridge owner Matty Maroon. Matt Maddock is a Republican representing Milford. He added the writer, as he told the Detroit News to, quote, close a loophole, unquote. But critics of the Republican proposal include former Republican Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly, who now heads up the Small Business Association of Michigan. Kelly said the new bridge is, quote, arguably the most important infrastructure project in North America, unquote. And he says the writer could stop bridge construction altogether. Kelly was in office when the deal was negotiated by his boss, former Governor Rick Snyder. Yeah, Jerry, I read this Detroit News story last night, and I thought that this is maybe the dumbest idea I've heard in I don't know how long, which... I don't know. I feel like there's been a parade of dumb ideas. Oh, for sure. I mean, this is the Trump era. So, I mean, to be able to say that is really saying something. I mean, uh, you know, I guess uh, Matt Maddock is uh, technically he's objecting to the fact that, you know, we're paying upfront costs for the construction and then we get reimbursed by Canada. And so I think it's some kind of technicality that he thinks, you know, he was quoted saying something like we shouldn't be a credit card. But, but we're getting paid back. And there's actually a record of us getting paid back. In fact, I believe I read a story because there are multiple articles on this around the idea that, well, I want to see canceled checks. I want to see proof. This has been happening for a while. Republicans have a long record now in Michigan of, you know, being on the dole from Matty Maroon, you know, again, the owner of the Ambassador Bridge, who has been fighting tooth and nail against this new. And, and we're crossing. not we're not mincing words here because in reality, I mean, there's a lot of. Uh, heavy hitters that are influencing politicians. And I think it needs to be called out more often. Absolutely. I mean, Rick Snyder basically bypassed the legislature altogether and and negotiated directly with the government of Canada to get this done because, thank God, he was sensible enough to realize that this is a really important project for us and we need an alternative to a privately owned bridge by a, frankly, terrible corporate citizen in Matty Maroon. Tell us how you really feel, Sven. <laughs> But this proposal, this bridge proposal, this bridge project is something that's actually supported by people on both sides of the aisle. You look at on the left, you've got unions who are going to be seeing a lot more work with the automotive suppliers, things like that. You've got pro pro business Republicans or I should say pro general business Republicans. Mm -hmm. And the amount of trade that goes through Detroit is huge. And people don't realize it because they just see the bridge and it sits there and you see trucks go back and forth. But it's a really big economic deal. And without uh, greater connections to Canada in this international world, uh, you're going to see Detroit's economy get strangled. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to pin down exactly what uh, Maddox objection is to this. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know that I entirely buy that this is like this is some technicality and that no, the I legislature don't, I don't. needs greater oversight. Of Remember, this. I, he, I think that's kind of you know, BS, frankly. I, I mean, we are living in this bizarro era of trade, right? We're dealing with like tariffs against, you know, I mean, we just got past the the threats of Mexico tariffs and everything. Well, suspended and, threats, right? So reserving the right. rights to put them back on the table. Right. But I mean, we've got, you know, escalating trade war, you know, tariff threats and, and, real, and real tariffs against China, you know, threats against uh, Canada, everybody. Uh, and also, I think this is just a theory, but I think that a lot of Republicans uh, are are sort of using this as a test case. Like they want to show that like, oh, no, we can have a privately owned 
uh, international bridge crossing to Canada. We don't need a government-owned bridge when really the Ambassador Bridge ought to be a cautionary tale in the perils of having a privately owned international bridge. Macomb County residents could be asked to vote on a new tax to build a new jail. Next week, County Executive Mark Hackle's office will ask the County Board of Commissioners to approve the $375 million proposal at a special meeting. Hackle's office will also ask for approval of ballot language for a new tax millage to float new bonds that would pay for the new jail. If approved, the measures would need to go to the full board for a final okay. The jail would be located in Mount Clemens. It's hoped that it would reduce the high number of deaths in the Macomb County correction system. In recent years, the Macomb County Jail has seen a number of suicides, fatal drug overdoses, and deaths due to heart attacks and sepsis, among other causes. Macomb County has been sued multiple times for issues around the poor treatment of inmates. Security guards working at several buildings owned by Dan Gilbert's Bedrock Real Estate in downtown Detroit began a planned strike today. But it's not clear how widespread the walkout is among the employees of Secure America, the contractor hired to patrol Bedrock-owned buildings. Cranes reports that at least 10 security guards were picketing, but the Freep reports that most employees showed up for work Thursday anyway and stayed on the job. Secure America employees in Detroit voted on Monday to go on strike. The Service Employees International Union Local 1 tweeted a video showing picketers in front of the First National Building on Woodward. The union wants to organize the workers and support their push to increase hourly wages up to $15. The security guards are currently paid between $11 and $13 per hour, forcing many of them to work second jobs to make ends meet. Thanks to Milo for their support of the Daily Detroit podcast. Milo is a marketing agency that produces amazing experiences for audiences. They partner with their clients to drive business and create innovative content. Do cool stuff with them at milo.agency. The city of Detroit has broken ground on the Joseph Campo Greenway, a 1.2-mile landscaped pedestrian and bicycling path designed to connect east side neighborhoods to the Detroit riverfront. The $4.9 million project will run from East Verner to the River Walk, running parallel to and just east of the DeQuinder Cut. It'll replace existing pathways marred by broken concrete, worn-out recreation courts, flooding, and other issues. Plans call for a 10-foot-wide non-motorized path, recreational features, new seating and signage, and outdoor power stations. It'll feature landscaping, enhanced street crossings, and green stormwater infrastructure to prevent flooding. The project will be built in two phases, and it should be completed by fall 2020. This is going to be a great project. I, as people fans of the show know, that I am a fan of the east side. But there is, this helps unlock all of that potential over there to connect these neighborhoods to the riverfront. It's a really progressive vision to say we're not going to make the riverfront high-end condos all the way to the water like so many other cities have, that it's going to be an, an accessible and equitable place. Yeah, and so it's basically doing like kind of the basic blocking and tacking, tackling like quality of life type stuff, basically claiming this as a public asset free of cars and, you know, a great public gathering spot. I love it. Detroit's Fisher Building will mark Flag Day this Friday, that's tomorrow, by unveiling a collection of historic national flags that date back to the building's opening in 1928. The 60 flags once hung in the Fisher Building's arcade and were commissioned by the seven Fisher Brothers. Some of the countries represented have since adopted new flags or new borders, or in some cases no longer even exist, like Czechoslovakia. I, that that's close to my heart as I am part Slovak. Yeah. But I, not I, Czech. I, I originally thought Prussia might be an example too, but Prussia actually ceased to exist about 10 years before the Fisher Building was built. So mm. so the six by twelve banners sat in storage for decades, but were rediscovered in 1970 in a sealed off closet. You know, there's pretty terrifying things discovered from the 70s. Um <laughs> I had an uncle. I discovered a lot of terrifying things from the 70s, including his wedding suit that was brown was and it, white. Was it Naga Hyde? <laughs> the display inside the Fisher Arcade is free and open to the public through July 3rd. You can pick up free pamphlets that identify all the flags inside any of the Fisher Building's fine retail stores. We'll have a link to the Facebook event for more info. 
in the show notes. I got to say, Sven, and all jokes aside, I am super excited about this. I actually got to see these out like way back in the day. I want to say I was either like in my early 20s or before then, my teenager years. And I saw all these banners. They were really, really cool. I have very faint memories of them. I'm really excited to have bold and bright memories of these very soon. Staying in the new center, the Madison Heights-based retailer Beyond Juice will open its second Detroit location in the Boulevard. That's the name of the new mixed-use residential loft development taking shape on West Grand Boulevard at 3rd Avenue. Beyond Juice sells fresh-squeezed juices, smoothies, paninis, quinoa bowls, and other items. It operates a second location in Detroit in Eastern Market and eight locations overall. The first residential tenants of the six-story boulevard development move in later this month. Detroit was once called the Paris of the Midwest. Along those lines, in Paris there is a bridge where so-called love locks are attached by smitten couples. So here in Detroit, there's a new lock wall in Parker's Alley. That's the alley at the Shinola Hotel next to the Brakeman Beer Hall, which we talked about on a previous episode of the show. The newest is that Shinola is selling fancy padlocks with two keys for 25 bucks and offering included engraving of the lock that you can then attach to the lock wall with your loved one. The locks are made by Troy-based Commando Lock Company. And of course, there's a hashtag, Shinola Love Locks. Jer, why on earth was Detroit called the Paris of the Midwest? Well, as you remember, uh, Detroit was founded by the French. That's also in our Daily Detroit logo, the fleur de over there at the bottom. Uh, also, there was a lot of French elements in our building design over the years, especially pre-1920. And the thing is, is we have these really wide streets like the boulevard. You think about the Champs-Élysées, all of that. Did I say that right? You're the French guy. Champs-Élysées. Champs-Élysées. Got it. Uh, but a lot of our roads are very wide. If you think about Gratiot, if you think about um, the Cadillac Square, if you think about Woodward, we have wide boulevards, much like Paris, France. Does Paris have potholes like we do? I do not know. Anybody listening in France, tell us. How do the potholes compare? Before we let you go, here's a way to support neighborhood businesses in the city of Detroit. District 1 does a neat event called the Cash Flash. We've had Detroit City Councilman James Tate on the show before to talk about it. Well, their upcoming event celebrates Northwest Grand River Avenue. See, there's an $8 million road and street project happening to improve the neighborhood, so that's where they're doing this 10th Discover D1 Cash Flash to support those businesses while construction's going on. So if you want to check it out, the event's on Wednesday, June 26th from 6 to 8 p.m. It'll be on Grand River between Outer Drive and Evergreen. You can find out more at discoverd1.com. With that, we're all done for today. If you love what we're doing and want to keep pushing Detroit's conversation forward, be sure to tell a friend about the Daily Detroit podcast. We're planning a bonus episode for you tomorrow. So keep your ears to the ground and your eyes glued to your podcast feed. Also, thanks to the folks who work behind the scenes to help us make this go. Randy Walker, Cheyenne Nocerini, Bob and Dave here at Podcast Detroit, our spirits advisor, Nuri Gojai, who's off in the woods playing merriment. And of course, our Patreon members at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. I'm Sven Gustafson. And I'm Jared Stays. Take care of each other and we'll see you around Detroit. You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information.